Dysimpouchitis. I have no disclosures. So today we're going to discuss the incidence, risk factors, and pathogenesis of acute and chronic pouch inflammation, and we're going to explore the treatment strategies for chronic pouch inflammation. Approximately 15 to 20 percent of patients with UC will require colectomy despite our improvements in medical therapy. The likelihood and timing of colectomy depends on the extent of the disease and the severity of presentation. So about 20% of patients who present with pancreatitis will require colectomy at 10 years, while about 5% of patients who present with proctitis will require colectomy at 10 years. In order to provide GI tract continuity and avoid a permanent end ileostomy for these patients, surgeons create the ileal pouch anal anastomosis. And here in the US, the three-stage proctocolectomy of ileal pouch anal anastomosis is the most common surgery performed. The first stage involves a subtotal colectomy and a creation of an ileostomy. After three months, the second stage is performed, and that involves rectal removal, uh, ileal pouch construction, and a proximal diverting loop ileostomy creation. And the final stage, which is then created three months after that, is an ileostomy takedown and a restoration of intestinal continuity. And we counsel patients truly to expect about four to eight thick bowel movements per 24 hours as baseline after surgery. Patients aren't going to go back to their pre colitis baseline, and as part of informed consent, it's important to tell them what to expect. Um, many patients will require anti-motility agents to achieve this four to eight bowel movements within 24 hours, but the caveat is that we tell them they should have no urgency, excellent, incon uh, excellent continence, and no bleeding. So while their frequency is still greater than their pre baseline, they are getting rid of some of these additional um, symptoms that happen with colitis like urgency, hematochesia, and discomfort. However, the pouch is not without its complications. And while it offers patients continuity of the GI tract and avoidance of an ostomy, the most common complication is acute pouchitis. Right now, there's no defined classification system for pouchitis, and it actually can be classified according to ideology, duration of symptoms, or response to antibiotic treatment. Idiopathic pouchitis is the most common type. The prevalence of pouchitis actually increases with time in patients with UC, and the cumulative prevalence has been up to 80% in most recent studies. Secondary pouchitis can also occur, and this is typically due to infections like C. diff or CMV, ischemia, or autoimmune processes like IgG4 or primary sclerosis and cholangitis. So the pathogenesis of idiopathic pouchitis remains unclear, but it's thought to be a complex interaction between the microbiome, immune system in genetically susceptible patients. We think that the first step is fecal stasis that happens due to altered bowel anatomy during the construction of the ileal pouch. This promotes dysbiosis and variation of commensal bacteria. Dysbiosis together with exposure to an increased microbial load promotes colonic metaplasia of the ileal mucosa. So the ileal mucosa starts to take on adaptations and starts to look like colon. This activates the mucosal immune response, such as the innate and the adaptive immune systems, and these have been shown to be altered in patients with pouchitis compared to patients with a healthy pouch. The bottom line, it seems to be, is that dysbiosis or altered microbial loads are what driving the pouchitis process. So along that lines, then, the treatment of pouchitis is really based on this theory of dysbiosis. And so antibiotics are the first line for the treatment of pouchitis, and ciprofloxacin and metronidazole are the, typically the antibiotics of choice. Now, in choosing which one or the other or combination therapy, there's really only been one randomized controlled trial that compared cipro to metronidazole for acute pouchitis. It was small, only had about 19 patients, but it showed that there was significantly decrease in the pouchitis disease activity index and less adverse events with ciprofloxacin. Now, the remission rate after one antibiotic course for acute pouchitis is about 80%, but up to 60% of patients will have another, another episode of acute pouchitis. Alternative antibiotic regimens like Augmentin and Rifaximin have been tested, but there's not enough evidence to support their use right now. Um, there's not great evidence either for probiotics, unfortunately, in maintaining remission. There was a couple of studies earlier on that suggested VSL-3 as a novel uh, probiotic formulation that would support maintaining remission after episodes of acute pouchitis, but this was not validated and the study and the data actually was not replicated in serial studies. Fecal microbiota transplant has, invest, has been investigated a lot for pouchitis, and the theory makes sense. If the microbial load in the pouch is altered, then maybe if we can change it through fecal microbiota transplant, we can fix the underlying process. 
the studies have actually shown that it's been safe but not effective. And I think one of the big reasons is that the stool that they're using for FMT is actually coming from patients with a healthy colon. And they're putting it into patients with a pouch but at baseline, these microbiota are different. Um, so there's been some you know, discussion about using stool from a healthy pouch to put it into an unhealthy pouch as if you know, during fecal microbiota transplant, and potentially that could be the changing, the changing decision here. But for now, we know that FMT is safe, but not quite effective for patients with acute pouchitis. Now, taking a closer look at what antibiotics are actually doing to the microbiome, we see very interestingly that antibiotic treatment reduces disease-associated bacteria, but also reduces beneficial bacteria and diversity. In addition, and as a testament to the impact of the microbiome on symptoms, we see that antibiotics reduce fecal calpro and flare symptoms. So it seems to be that the efficacy of antibiotic treatment in pouchitis actually might be attributed to the establishment of an antibiotic-resistant microbiome that's not good, but not bad in the sense that it has a low inflammatory potential. And this microbiome might provide resistance against colonization by, bat, by bacteria that could be even worse that promotes more inflammation. So this study actually came out last year and was one of the first to show that antibiotics, while getting rid of both bad and good bacteria, seem to be creating a field of less bad bacteria where the inflammatory potential is less. There's always a conversation about antibiotic resistance and the risk of that long-term in patients who are on antibiotics. And this, the two studies that have actually been done in this field have shown that patients' regular microbiome actually returns after they stop antibiotics. So it seems that the resistance pattern that we might see with antibiotics in the pouch patients isn't as significant as we previously thought, which is very reassuring. Now, we talked a little bit before about how 20% you know, 60% of patients will have one episode of recurrence after the treatment of acute pouchitis, but actually up to 20% of patients will actually progress to chronic pouchitis or chronic pouch inflammation. There's no great classification system for chronic pouch inflammation. I like to um, actually define chronic pouch inflammation as to three different disease entities. One is antibiotic dependent, second is antibiotic refractory, and the third and often most difficult to manage is Crohn's disease like chronic pouch inflammation. So 60% develop at least one recurrence after the first episode of acute pouchitis. And as we said, 20% will develop chronic pouch inflammation. In patients who have chronic antibiotic dependent pouchitis, these patients require antibiotics long-term as maintenance therapy. They have greater than three relapses per year when antibiotics are withdrawn, and they're typically maintained on the lowest effective antibiotic dose. In patients who have chronic antibiotic refractory pouchitis, these patients have persistent symptoms and objective inflammation despite repeated antibiotic courses. And these are patients who are really not responding to antibiotics long-term and escalation to additional therapy is typically considered. In addition to chronic antibiotic dependent and refractory pouchitis, there's Crohn's disease like pouch inflammation, which presents phenotypically very similar to traditional Crohn's disease. It's important to realize that these are patients who had a confirmed colitis diagnosis pre-colectomy. So there are not patients who are misdiagnosed as Crohn's disease, um, who are misdiagnosed as ulcerative colitis, and then later had their diagnosis changed to Crohn's disease. These are patients whose colectomy sample looked 100% like ulcerative colitis, and yet after their pouch surgery are presenting with symptoms and manifestations similar to Crohn's disease. So here, Crohn's disease like pouch inflammation, or CDLPI, is characterized by either inflammation of the pouch that's resistant to antibiotics or inflammation of the pre-pouch ileum, stricturing of the afferent limb or proximal small bowel and or fistulizing disease that's involving the pouch perineum or small bowel. So again, manifestations that are very similar to traditional Crohn's disease. The treatment of chronic pouch inflammation is actually quite difficult and there's no randomized controlled data as guidance. Whereas you know, the treatment for traditional UC and CD, plentiful studies and many review papers. Chronic pouchitis and Crohn's disease like pouch inflammation are also typically considered together in studies under the umbrella of chronic pouch inflammation. Uh, steroid therapy specifically with oral budesonide has been tried in multiple small studies with reported remission rates of 60 to 75%. And here remission is in each study is actually defined very differently. And that's why it can be difficult to come away from these studies with a reasonable concept of how to manage chronic pouch inflammation. Here in this study of oral budesonide, they defined remission as a decrease in clinical endoscopic and histologic findings in the pouchitis disease activity index. Little data exists regarding the use of immunomodulator 
therapy, whether it's tacrolimus or 6MP or azathioprine for antibiotic refractory pouchitis. This was actually a prospective study in Japan where they treated 10 patients with uh, enema suspension tacrolimus and found remission rates as high as 90%. As of right now, there's no other studies that suggest the use of immunomodulators in patients with chronic pouch inflammation. And there have been multiple observational studies that have described benefit with biologics, specifically the anti-TNF agents, vedolizumab and istekinumab, with remission rates of 30 to 60%. And we're gonna go into that in a bit more. This was a systematic review with a meta-analysis of TNF therapy in refractory pouchitis and Crohn's disease-like pouch inflammation. And here the authors identified 21 articles and three abstracts and included over 300 patients who were treated with either infliximab or adalimumab. And the rate of short-term remission after induction was 50% and the long-term remission was 52%. So pretty good and pretty comparative to the traditional rates of remission in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. What's interesting here is that it seemed that the rate of remission after TNF induction therapy was actually higher in the Crohn's disease-like pouch inflammation group than the chronic antibiotic refractory pouchitis group. And one question that often comes up is, can you reuse the same drug, specifically the same anti-TNF agent for a patient for their pouch inflammation if they were on this drug pre-colectomy. So we're using the TNF pre-colectomy and post-pouch. We actually did a retrospective study here at Mount Sinai where we looked at 83 patients who were on biologic therapy for chronic pouch inflammation. And about half were on anti-TNF agents pre-colectomy for UC, and a little more than half were on anti-TNF agents after pouch surgery for chronic pouch inflammation. And what we found was that patients who were exposed to the anti-TNF agents pre-colectomy and post-pouch were less likely to experience clinical remission and more likely to have pouch failure. And so this suggests that patients should be placed on a different class of biologics for chronic pouch inflammation than they were on their pre-colectomy for their UC. Vetalizumab has also been looked at for the treatment of chronic pouch inflammation. This was a retrospective multi-center study that included 83 patients. And the proportion of patients that achieved at least clinical response was approximately 40% at three months, 43% at six months, and then 28% at 12 months. The rates of remission were much lower between 12 and 20%. And of the 74 patients who had pouchoscopy, the proportion of patients who had endoscopic response or healing was about 54% and 17% respectively. What's interesting in the study is that they found that patients who developed pouchitis symptoms rapidly, less than one year after their final surgical stage, we're less likely to respond to vetalizumab, which suggests that having a more aggressive phenotype early on might increase the risk of non-response to vetalizumab. Ustekinumab has also been investigated for chronic pouch inflammation. This was a retrospective single center study with 24 patients who were treated and included for analysis. And you can see that about 50% of patients had a clinical response with a median number of bowel movements decreasing from eight to six within 24 hours. 13 patients had pouchoscopies after istekinumab treatment, so not all of the patients, only a subset. But what was interesting was that in these patients, there was a significant reduction in the percent ulcerated surface um, on a pouchoscopy. So this is suggesting that istekinumab improves not only clinical, but also endoscopic outcomes. And here, of the patients who had Crohn's disease-like pouch inflammation, having a higher BMI at the start of therapy and being a male were both predictors of non-response at six months. So in conclusion, um, and I thank everyone for their attention, pouchitis is the most common long-term complication after IPA surgery with about 80% cumulative prevalence. We're seeing a lot more diagnosis of chronic pouch inflammation. Traditionally, we know about 20% of patients develop it after surgery, but just anecdotally, it seems that we're seeing greater numbers now that we're making the diagnosis more readily and earlier. The types of chronic pouch inflammation can be considered as chronic antibiotic refractory or Crohn's disease-like pouch inflammation. And treatment options for chronic pouch inflammation include oral budesonide as a bridge to infliximab, vetalizumab, or istekinumab. And again, I thank everybody for their attention.